Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to all of you. This week is the 15th Sunday after the day of Pentecost, and the readings that uh, we have before us today all revolve around different aspects of the cross, cross-bearing, what it means to be under the cross, and to carry our own cross. Today, my sermon is based on the Gospel of St. Matthew, chapter 16. The theme for my sermon is, This is Going to Hurt. Today, one special thing about our order of service is in place of our traditional psalm, we're going to have a video of the Handbell's Choir. So with those things in mind, we begin today's service by singing, Let Us Ever Walk with Jesus. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you. 
God invites us to come into his presence and worship him with humble and penitent hearts. Therefore, let us acknowledge our sinfulness and ask him to forgive us. Holy and merciful Father, I confess that I am by nature sinful and that I have disobeyed you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have done what is evil and failed to do what is good. For this I deserve your punishment both now and in eternity. But I am truly sorry for my sins and trusting in my Savior Jesus Christ I pray, Lord have mercy on me, a sinner. May you please stand and receive the words of absolution. God our Heavenly Father has been merciful to us and has given his only son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ and by his authority, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. For all that we need in life and for the wisdom to use all your gifts with gratitude and joy, hear our prayer, O Lord. Mercy. For the steadfast assurance that nothing can separate us from your love and for the courage to stand firm against the assaults of Satan and every evil, hear our prayer, O Christ. For the well-being of your holy church in all the world and for those who offer here their worship and praise, hear our prayer, O Lord. Merciful God, maker and preserver of life, uphold us by your power and keep us in your tender care. The works of the Lord are great and glorious. His name is worthy of praise. Let us pray. O Lord Jesus Christ, preserve the congregation of believers with your never-failing mercy. Help us avoid whatever is wicked and harmful and guide us in the way that leads to our salvation. For you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Please be seated. Our first reading comes from the Old Testament book of Judges, and it revolves around the life of Samson. You will recall that in Samson's life, he did certain things in rebellion against God that brought about grief in his own life. But in the end, he died serving the Lord, and it cost him his life. Our reading is from Judges chapter 16. And in the EHV version, which I'm reading, you're going to come across the word serenes. And this is not a word that is familiar to us. It is a transliteration simply of the Hebrew word, and it means rulers or um, kings. But the hair on Samson's head began to grow after it had been shaved. 
Meanwhile, the Serenes of the Philistines gathered to make a great sacrifice to their god Dagon and to celebrate. They said, Our God has given our enemy Samson into our hands. When the people saw him, they praised their God. Our God has given our enemy into our hands, the devastator of our land, who has caused the death of many of us. When they were feeling good, they said, Send for Samson so that he can provide amusement for us. They summoned Samson from the prison, and he served as their entertainment. They made Samson stand between the pillars. He said to the thousand more men and women watching Samson as he was amusing them, Samson called out to the Lord. He said, Lord God, remember me, I pray. Give me strength, I pray this one more time. O oh God, let me revenge, get revenge on the Philistines for my two eyes in one act of vengeance. Samson then grasped the two central pillars supporting the building. He leaned against them, one with his right hand and one with his left. Samson said, let me die with the Philistines. He pushed with all his strength, and the building fell upon the Syrians and upon all the people who were inside. The Philistines he put to death when he died were more numerous than those he had put to death during his lifetime.
Our second lesson comes to us from Galatians chapter 6. Those who want to look good in the flesh are the ones who are trying to compel you to be circumcised. Their only reason is so that they are not persecuted for the cross of Christ. As a matter of fact, those who are circumcised do not keep the law themselves, but they want to have you circumcised so that they can boast about your flesh. But far be it from me to boast, except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, through which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. In fact, in Christ Jesus, circumcision or uncircumcision does not matter. What matters is being a new creation, peace and mercy on those who follow this rule, namely on the Israel of God. This is the word of the Lord. Our verse of the day is Jeremiah 15, 16. Alleluia, your words became a joy to me and the delight of my heart. Alleluia. May you please stand for the reading of the Gospel. The Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the 16th chapter. From that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he had to go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders, chief priests, and experts in the law, and be killed, and on the third day be raised again. Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, May you receive mercy, Lord. This will never happen to you. But Jesus turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are a snare to me, because you are not thinking the things of God, but the things of men. Then Jesus said to his disciples, If anyone wants to follow me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. In fact, Whoever wants to save his life will lose it, and whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. After all, what will it benefit a person if he gains the whole world but forfeits his soul? Or what can a person give in exchange for his soul? This is the Gospel of our Lord. Be to you. Please be seated. Our hymn of the day is Jesus, I, My Cross, Have Taken.
Grace, mercy, and peace unto you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. This is going to hurt. There's some places where you would expect to hear those words, right? Sometimes where it's clearly appropriate. School begins again. You're on the high school football team. And first day of practice, you would imagine those words coming out of the coach's mouth, right? This is going to hurt. A real intensive training. Or we can think of another place, of course, dentist's office, doctor's office. I'm sure some things have happened there, be it a root canal or a shot or something along those lines, and the doctor, the dentist says, this is going to hurt. But what about here? What about church? Is there a place for these words to be spoken right here at church? Is it ever appropriate? This is the question we must have on our minds as we really in understand the interaction between Jesus and Peter in today's gospel. Today's words from Jesus show us without a shadow of a doubt that this is going to hurt has a place within the church. It has to be part of our Christian experience and our walk with Jesus. It is necessary. It is essential. But obviously, it's not the only thing we're going to experience as Christians, right? It's not the only thing, but it has to be there this side of heaven. There are certain hurts that are essential to Christians this side of heaven because we're sinners, we live in a fallen, sinful world, and God always has his enemies. But this hurt, these pains that we go through here, they are not going to stay with us forever. Hurt and pain will end here in this world as we are destined for something better. Of course, being with God in heaven, where there is no hurt, no pain, and Jesus would have already wiped away every tear from our eyes. Our text for today is deeply connected to the gospel from last week. It's, it's seamless right there in Matthew chapter 16. And you might remember as Pastor Kruger was, of course, leading last week's service, uh, the gospel there had Jesus ask this powerful question of his disciples, who do you say that I am? And it was Peter. It was Peter that gave the right answer. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus praised Peter. He praised him for giving that right answer. And of course, it was by the work of the Holy Spirit that prompted Peter to be able to give that right answer. But there was something still lacking there. Peter got the words right. He got the concept right. But he didn't fully understand. What did it mean? What did it mean that Jesus is the Christ? And that's where today's gospel begins. From that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he had to go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders, chief priests, and experts in the law and be killed and on the third day be raised again. Jesus had to explain this. They had a concept, of course, the idea of the Messiah. That is simply the Hebrew word for Christ. Messiah is Hebrew. Christ is Greek. It's the same word, the same concept, the same title. And it means the anointed one. And God had promised this anointed one, this Messiah Christ, of course, throughout the whole Old Testament, that he would one day come. But people did not appreciate exactly what they meant. And we really can't blame them too, right? The Son of God is going to come down. Christ's own anointed one is going to be in this world. We'd expect that he would be warmly received that people would love him, that everything he said would be warmly received. And we cannot think and blame the disciples for having those anticipations that things would be easy. But of course, that's far from the truth, right? And Jesus had to explain all of this. Being the Christ did not mean coming into the world to be served and to be honored and to have everything easy. Now, there's a lot of things that Jesus did, right? There was a lot of things that he was expected to do. 
And God, Jesus, did so much more than what anybody could have anticipated. Those followers, those people anticipating the Messiah, they would have been just so happy had Jesus established an earthly kingdom, had he kicked out the Romans, and they just had a er normal earthly empire. They would have been more than happy about that. But that's not why Jesus came. Yes, Jesus came to reveal God's truth. Jesus came to preach the gospel. Jesus came and he couldn't but help to heal people that were sick and to feed those who were hungry and do all of those different things. But if Jesus only did those things, his mission would have been a failure. Jesus came to do more than just simply preach or simply heal people here this side of heaven. Jesus came as a warrior to defeat our greatest foes, sin, the devil himself, and to conquer even death. Being the Messiah means being rejected. It means suffering the pains and feeling the hurt of receiving the punishment for the sins of the whole world. It means becoming sin for us. That's how much Jesus took from us and the punishment that he endured. And only Jesus could do that. Only Jesus could defeat the power of the devil and conquer death. Only by Jesus receiving that full punishment by his Father that led up to his exclamation on the cross, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Could Jesus accomplish what the Messiah, the Christ, was all about? And you know what? He did those things. He did those things for you. And because of that, every single one of your sins has been paid for. Jesus suffered the greatest pain so that you would never have to. Jesus endured hell so that you would not. And he knew that cost. He knew that cost his whole life, and that cross was ever before him. He knew what he was here to do. And he had to explain this to his disciples because it was just so difficult for them to accept it. The cross was the only way of salvation. Remember how earnestly Jesus prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane? Father, if this cup could be taken from me, if there's any other way we could do this, because it was going to be so painful, it was simply going to hurt to save the world. But Jesus did it. You know why? There is no Christ without the cross. There is no cross without the hurt and the pain and the suffering. And there is no salvation, there is no everlasting life for you, for me, for anyone, if Jesus didn't die. And this is something I just want to be so clear about in my sermon. You know, because Jesus suffered hell for you and for me, for indeed every sinner when he died on the cross, any pain, any suffering, any hurt that you go through, it's not to somehow get you into heaven. It's not to pay for the sins. Jesus accomplished all of that. But I think this is why we struggle, because Christ paid all the price, yet we still suffer, don't we? We still go through pains. We still feel hurt. But not one of those things can contribute to your salvation. Yes, our Christian life is not going to be free from hurt and pain. And this is what Jesus is teaching us. If we're going to be connected to him, we can experience trouble and we can expect it in so many different ways and from so many different sources. You know, each one of us is a lot like Peter. I can only imagine, you know, when this event with Jesus explaining what it meant to really be the Messiah about going to Jerusalem, being rejected, suffering, and dying. Can you imagine the look on Peter's face? His face must have just dropped. And there's a part of his brain that probably just kind of short-circuited because none of that made sense. How could this happen to Jesus? And his heart must have initially just weighed so heavy. Because think about it, by this time, Peter had walked with Jesus for years. This was his teacher. This was the one that he put all of his hope in. And for Peter to hear now that Jesus is going to be rejected and suffer and die, and Jesus just didn't use those vague words, right? He was going to Jerusalem to be crucified the most painful, the most horrendous, the most public way 
to die. We can just imagine how Peter was just astounded. None of that could make sense. And certainly he would not want to see Jesus go through that. But there's something more basic than that too, right? If Jesus, who at the, because he was so powerful, had the ability to just speak a violent storm to become quiet, if Jesus had the power to raise the dead, if Jesus had the power to heal these individuals, if Jesus was going to suffer and be crucified, that, Peter, that meant Peter knew pain was coming his way. If Jesus wasn't going to be free from that kind of punishment, what would happen to Peter? And just appreciate that, that knowledge that this is leading to something very painful. And no wonder from that perspective that Peter rebuked Jesus. He didn't want to see Jesus suffer, but neither did he want to suffer at all. To be a true disciple of Jesus is to experience hurt and pain. And there's no way to get around it. Jesus says this, If anyone wants to follow me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. Let him deny himself. Let him say no to himself. Let that follower of mine pick up his instrument of death, that painful way to die, and then come along. We'll go on the journey together. There's no such thing as a painless or a cross-free Christianity. Certainly it wasn't there for Jesus, and neither is there for you or for me. The cross is unavoidable. In the end, what's going to happen is either your faith and your love of Jesus is going to allow you to say no to the world and endure those hurts and pains, or you're going to say it's not worth it. And I would rather have the peace and the comfort and the security and all the pleasures of the world. Only one is going to win. Only one is going to win. And this is what Jesus says too, right? In fact, whoever wants to save his life will lose it. And whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. You know, one of the great problems today, but it was also the problem in Luther's day, it was also the problem in the days of the apostles. It's a perennial problem. The people of God don't want to be hurt. They don't want to experience pain. They certainly don't want to suffer. You know, there's so many of us here in worship today, and we each have our own personalities. We each have our own desires. We're in different stages of our life. And you know, I don't know what you want in your immediate future. You know, some of you might want to just have that ability to retire. You might want to have that assurance of a clean bill of health. Maybe there's something earthly that you want you know, that's not sinful, but it's something you're striving after. I don't know what you want, but you know, it doesn't matter who you are. I know what you don't want. And I know what you don't want is to suffer. I know you don't want to feel pain. I know you don't want to be hurt. But it's unavoidable. And that's what Jesus is simply telling us today. This is going to hurt because we have to deny ourselves and say no to sin. And we don't want to do that, do we? We don't want to say no to sin. We don't want to give up the things of the world. We don't want to be different. And a lot of times where that leaves us is we like to have just enough sin and have the comfort of going and having that sin forgiven. But we know it's not right. And we have that internal battle in us. And it's something that we're going to have to fight with every single day of our lives as long we're, as we're here in this world with that old sinful nature. There's no getting around it. And you know what? There's times when it hurts. It hurts to say no. But we have to do it. This is going to hurt because we have been called to greatness. You know, I don't think we dwell on that enough. I know that we see each other and ourselves as Christians in this world. 
and we know on some level that that makes us different than the world and God willing we, we recognize it solely by the grace of God his full and free gift that we are who we are as Christians but I don't know if we dwell enough on the fact that we've been called to greatness to do amazingly great things and it's not easy it is not easy to be a Christian it is not easy to do right in the face of what is so easily done wrong in this world and that's why Paul says it this way therefore I urge you brothers by the mercies of God to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice holy and pleasing to God which is your appropriate worship also do not conform to the pattern of this world but be transformed by the renewal of your mind is it easy to live a great life no otherwise it wouldn't be great right we're called to say no to ourselves we're called to stand firm in a world that is rushing headlong into hell we are called to love our enemies to pray for those who hate us to do the will of God in this world and when we do that which is right almost all the times the world is going to say you're the problem you're making things so much worse and the result of us doing right is to receive more persecution it is not easy you know it's not easy to live a great life because the things that we do in church are so contrary to the things of the world you know go back to Peter as he was standing before Jesus and Jesus was explaining what it meant that he was the Christ and the suffering that was going to be unavoidable and and Peter just no no it can't be this way if you're the Christ it's got to be easy I don't want to hear this and, and Peter rebukes him but what did Jesus say to him get behind me Satan you are a snare to me because you are not thinking the things of God but the things of men to live a truly great life in the eyes of the Lord is to live according to his ways and everything that God lays out is so contrary to the pattern and the ways of the world around us you know just think about this those Apostles Peter and the others except for Judas and then eventually Paul they picked up their crosses didn't they not the cross of Jesus that leads to salvation only Jesus could die on that one but they each had to pick up their own personal cross and how many times did they have to say no to themselves how many times did they do the difficult thing how many times were they persecuted for loving others and preaching the gospel do you think they had an easy life all of them die as martyrs except for John and he dies in a way in his own martyrdom as a very old man as he sees these persecutions breaking out of the out against the church not one of them not one of them had an easy life but every single one had a great life these people who were fishermen and simple people they went up against the Jewish authorities they went up against the power of Rome and they even went up against the power of the devil and look at the Christian Church today that is a great life and what they did we do and God gives each of us our own cross what was a cross for Paul in many ways can't be the cross that you are going to bear but you have to bear the cross that God gives you and when you do I assure you that great things are going to happen this is going to hurt because God designed it to be this way and all I mean by that is again there are things that God does that are so contrary to the ways of the world that we find it difficult we find it difficult and there are things I think are both set up purposely by God not to bring about pain or suffering but to bring about a good and it's not always easy you know think for example how contrary the church has been throughout history you know in Jesus's day people were critical of the church because women were so elevated 
You know, in Christ, there's neither male nor female. We're all on equal standing as we stand before God. And the ancient world said that was too much. And today, people struggle because they don't really understand the principles God has set forth. And they see that, you know, Emmanuel and churches in the wells, they don't allow women to vote. And the only thing that they conclude is because people can vote in society and they can't vote at church, that the church has got to be wrong. And it doesn't occur to them, it doesn't occur to them that God sets up principles within the church that are not going to conform to the ways of the world. And rather than being a burden, it's an opportunity for us to grow and to love one another and to grow in the grace of God. Yet how often that is so misunderstood these days. And it breaks my heart because, you know, there are individuals that have left the church and the reason they end up saying, and a lot of times it's just one reason, but they'll say, well, we don't like how men and women have different roles in the church. But you know what didn't happen? A real honest examination of the biblical principles. That discussion never happened. Because some people didn't want to hear about it or it just didn't fit what was comfortable for them. They didn't want to have the least bit of discomfort of what God had laid out. We can't avoid it. There are things that are challenging and difficult for us and it's not because God overlooked what was in our future or that he didn't understand how the world would be, but he allows us to go through difficult times so that we can trust one another, so that we can love one another, so that we can show the world that we're all participating in something far greater than ourselves. And that is a beautiful message to the world. God allows us to struggle to bring about great blessings, and sometimes it hurts. So know this, my brothers and sisters in Christ. If you want to be a genuine believer in an inn and a follower of Jesus, you are going to experience pain. At some point, it's going to hurt, and that is the cross. Picking up your cross and following the one who died on his cross is the only way to get to heaven. Think about the words of Paul. Yes, our momentary light trouble produces for us an eternal weight of glory that is far beyond any comparison. We are not focusing on what is seen, but on what is not seen. For the things that are seen are temporary, but the things that are not seen are eternal. What hurts today, it's not going to last. But you know what lasts? your everlasting life with God. Amen. And now may the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, keep our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. May you please stand as we will confess our Christian faith with the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became fully human. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who in unity with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy, Christian, and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. 
Gracious God and Father, we praise you for the countless blessings which we receive from your hand, the beauties of creation and the bounties of the earth, the joy of life and the pleasure of friendship, the good of work and the gift of rest, the privilege to share happiness and sorrow with one another. Above all, we praise and thank you for your saving word and for your son's body and blood, which you give us to eat and to drink in the sacrament. Through these means of grace, you send the Holy Spirit into our hearts and unite us to Jesus and to the whole Christian church on earth. Strengthen us through this heavenly food. Increase our trust in Christ and our love for one another. Great God and Lord, without your continuing help, we easily waver in our faith, lose courage, and grow careless in our watchfulness. The times and days are perilous. Give us strength to face the evils of each day with fresh confidence. Open our lips to speak of your grace and move us to use the gifts that you give us to share your word of salvation with all people. Protect and prosper the family, the school, the government, and all good institutions that you have established for the benefit of society. Remember in mercy those who are sick and suffering and bring your healing to troubled homes and lives. Move us to pray for those in need and to help them with deeds of kindness. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you that you sent your one and only Son to suffer on the cross that we would never experience hell. It takes no, gives you no pleasure that we go through pain and suffering in this world and you allow us to lift up our voices to you in prayer. Today we lift up to you Dean Tesh, who continues to battle illness, and we pray for Phyllis Bourne, who is recovering from an unexpected surgery. Dear Lord, we also give you praise and thanks as Irvin and Dolores Schmidt will celebrate their 64th wedding anniversary on September 8th. You have seen them through good times and through difficult times, and you've provided for all of their needs, giving them the most important gift of faith itself. Bless them on their anniversary. Hear us, Lord, as we bring you our private petitions. Now, eternal God and Father, keep us in the saving faith and so enable us to overcome all things through our Lord Jesus Christ. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Please be seated as we continue with our next hymn.
Brothers and sisters, go in peace, live in harmony with one another, serve the Lord with gladness. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Sunday is the second uh, Sunday of the month, and so this week we do have communion following service. I have chosen some select verses from one of the communion hymns, as it feels like it's been a long time since we sang any communion hymns. Our last uh, song is, Come, O Savior, to your table. I don't really have any uh, big announcements or anything other than just to let the ladies of the congregation know that the feedback we received in the LWMS is that we are going to be having an online 
fall rally. The details of all of that are being worked out, but I believe that we as the, the women that participate in LWMS can meet here and we could watch that uh, video uh, here together at church. So I'll be getting more information your way in the next week or so. As I said earlier today, we will be having communion. Uh, I will meet you in the uh, fellowship hall uh, just momentarily. God's richest blessings on you this day.